Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you find yourselves in. This is another of the excellent seminars or webinars of the International Manifesto Group. Today, we're going to be discussing the political crisis in Peru, causes and possible outcomes, as everybody is aware of what is going on there. I am Francisco Dominguez, I, the um, head of the research group of Latin America at Middlesex University in London in the United Kingdom. And before I move into it, uh, I'll be talking about the panelists later on as I introduce them and I'll give more information about them. But just at this stage, just to give their names, according to the order that we have is Anaí Durand, Oli Vargas, Hector Bejar, Eliana Carlin, and Ben Norton. Um, I just want to say a couple of things to contextualize and to set the tone, as it were, of what we may want to discuss. Uh, first of all, um, I want to report on solidarity activities in the UK about Peru, which I think is important um, just to make people aware that as soon as the crisis broke out in Peru, um, the solidarity movement in the UK immediately put Peru on the radar, invited people to write articles, publicize stuff everywhere. And we have a very good connection with Labour Friends of Progressive Latin America, which is a group of Labour MPs. That is to say, you know, we have a maximum exposure for any issue that we, went, we may want to raise. They have um, an internet site, which is called Labour Outlook. Labour Outlook, I beg your pardon. Um, which publishes, you know, material information, details, campaign work, analysis, and so on. And there's been a few already on Peru. And we even had the privilege of having one article by Anaí Durand which was published right away with a short video. And more important than that, we managed to get the, to persuade the organizers of the Latin America Adelante Conference, uh, which took place, Latin America Adelante Conference 2022, but it took place in January, 2023, which is normally attended by between 500 to 700 activists, trade union leaders, MPs, uh, journalists and so on, which is quite an important solidarity conference in Latin America in Europe. I think it's the biggest one there. Um, we had a very well attended panel on Peru. So right away, people started to ask questions, express how to express solidarity and so on. So that is important to have in mind as a part of the activities that we want to undertake. I want to just sketchily raise a few questions regarding the situation in Peru. Number one, in the last few years, the crisis of political legitimacy of the oligarchy is being tested quite massively. Um, not so much by mass movement, but certainly because of their own inability to sort out their own problems. In the last few years, there have been six presidents, which is a clear indication of their inability to stabilize the situation. And the biggest surprise was obviously in 2021 when a rural teacher was elected to become the president, well, won the first round, Pedro Castillo. The surprise was so big that even CNN recognized publicly they have to scramble for a CV because they didn't know who he was. In fact, they thought so little of him that actually it wasn't even counted as a possibility for the second round. And when he won the second round, then obviously the situation in Peru changed quite dramatically. I think summarizing brutally what we have in Peru, um, we had at the time, but the manifestations now are much more dynamic, much more sharp, is a parliamentary dictatorship. Uh, the oligarchy rules through parliament and uses parliament in every possible way to actually get their way. And therefore making administrations, government extremely weak. And this is one of the sources of the 
complications and the crisis there. Um, they decided that they were going to do two things, in my view. Number one, they were going to punish the Pedro Castillo and his people so hard that, you know, they wouldn't actually think again of having the audacity to challenge the oligarchy in order to elect a president that came from the rural areas, especially somebody with indigenous features. Um, and they made, the second point was to make the government impossible. That is to say, they create a situation which make impossible for Castillo to actually govern. And just to give an idea, which is a long story cut, cut very short, uh, in the year and a half that Castillo was in office, he was compelled, forced by parliamentary maneuvering by the right wing and the oligarchy to appoint ministers and change ministers 78 times. So that gives you an idea, you know, one year and a half, you, you, you move a new, and the problem is in the case of Peru, that if you appoint a new minister, the minister have to approve by parliament. So you can appoint somebody you may want, but parliament may decide otherwise, and you have to put forward somebody else. And you have to put somebody else, put forward somebody else until parliament agrees to accept it. So at the end of the day, parliament was more or less participating quite actively in the composition, political composition of Castillo's government. You know, in that context, poor Pedro Castillo have to make all sort of maneuvers, compromises, acrobatics, and so on. But we knew that whatever he did, and he knew, I think, as well, that whatever he did would not be sufficient because they will, they wanted to get rid of him. And this happened on the 7th of December, 2022. Um, he was charged with something like permanent moral incapacity, which is a very peculiar, uh, you know, legal terminology, but they used that. It was basically a coup d'etat. And this was followed by number one, a surprise for the oligarchy that the masses reacted very energetically throughout the country, not necessarily in every place in the same way, but certainly from the rural areas where Castillo came from and other areas such like those. Um, the level of mobilization was extraordinary. The oligarchy decided to actually crush brutally this manifestation of rebellion. And as far as I'm aware, the number of people who are being killed by repression is in the is over 60. And in some cases, I think this is known, but I want to repeat it anyway. Some people um, had the wound of the bullet in their chest or their stomach. Sorry to be so detailed about this, but it's important this is known. And they had a hole going in, but they hadn't, didn't have any hole coming out. And the reason was these were special bullets, deliberately designed to destroy somebody inside so horribly. And um, the basic idea behind that was, you know, deterrence. That is to say, if you mobilize, this might happen to you. They assassinated young people, people of 15 years old, 17 years old, old people, women, and so on. There, are, there were instances where in one of the manifestations, in one of the demonstrations, they used helicopters to fire at the demonstrators from above. That, I don't really know what the caliber of the bullets that were used, but helicopters tend to use bigger bullets than you know, soldiers. So you can imagine what the consequences were with that. So that was the problem. That, that is what the situation is. And despite this repression, there has been the rise of a powerful mass movement, which has not, you know, gone back. They continue to mobilize, continue to organize. Their demands, as far as I know, are, can be summarized in four points that our Peruvian speakers might qualify that at more. But if number one is the resignation of Dina, Dina Boluarte, because she was not elected. And she was the vice president who betrayed her principles. And then she's been presiding over the repression of the population with, I would say, gusto. 
because you have to keep, you know, you have to keep happy the people who are sponsoring her. Number two, immediate elections. Uh, Parliament at the time when Castillo was still the president had a rate of disapproval, re, you know, in the region of 78, 80%. The latest information, if they are correct, are that Parliament has a rate of disapproval that goes beyond 92%. That is to say, where there to be genuine, free and fair, Election for parliament, the oligarchy will lose very massively. So therefore, they began to introduce all sorts of mechanisms, all sorts of legal restrictions and restrictions of every kind to make sure that, you know, radical people, people with proposals are not elected. We'll see how that goes. And then the third demand is the re some people demand the reinstatement, sorry, reinstatement of Pedro Castillo as the president, some demand the reinstatement and the liberation of Pedro Castillo because he is in prison, and some demand only the liberation. And then finally, I think this is the most important proposal, is they are demanding an election, the kind of referendum for a constituent assembly, because they want to create the context for a new constitution, because the one they have was passed under the dictatorship of Alberto Fujimori back in the 90s. So this is the context. So what I want to do now is very briefly to problematize this, if I may, for our speakers to come back on them. They don't have to, but it's the discussion that we need to have, I think. Number one, how far is the oligarchy prepared to go by attempting to crush the movement? Are they prepared to go to the, to the Fujimorista days when they use massive repression by killing everybody? Um, in about one decade, they assassinated. I know there are, it's more complex than this, but 70,000 people were assassinated. So this is, you know, imagine if you want to crush the movement, would you be prepared to go to, back to that? It doesn't look that it's possible, but there are some currents and some politicians in the right wing that are quite willing, are proposing such a thing, not necessarily in so many words, but clearly that's what they want. Number two, how is the mass movement faring? Is it getting stronger? Is it getting weaker? Is it getting better organized? What information do we have? And then the third point is the main components of the mass movement. The media here try to suggest some of them, you know, very maliciously, as they always do, which is this was a rebellion of a rural movement because they were opposed to, more, to modernization, which is sort of normal. So therefore things will settle down. Is it only rural the mass movement that exists? Is it only is all is it also in the cities? Does it involve trade unions and so on? I think we have the answer to that, but it will be interesting to get details. Um the other point is that the Peruvian de facto dictatorship is isolated in Latin America. We know there are potentials for CELAC to do something about it. Not that I'm proposing necessarily, but I think is that I mentioned we have to consider in terms of how the reality works, but also UNASUR. UNASUR is going to be reinstated very quickly, set more countries after Brazil are joining in. So that's a possibility that something can be done. And the final point I want to make is this. There seems to be a problem, and this I'm saying this not necessarily to tell people what to do, never would do that. But there is an issue of the leadership. You know, there is an issue of political leadership in Peru. There is an issue of political leadership in other places as well. Um, the example I want to use for this is that the, is the one in Honduras. In Honduras, the National Front of Popular Resistance or the Popular Front of National Resistance became, was a coalition of political social forces to unions, Afro descendants, women, indigenous people, and so on. Um, and they came together in this front, which morphed into what we know now as Libre, which is the political party that was behind the candidacy of Xiomara Castro. It took them some, some time. I mean, it took them 12 years to get to this point. Nevertheless, the successful election of such a small country, which is almost totally dominated by the United States and getting away with it, and now, you know, transforming the lives of people there and also 
inserting itself geopolitically in a very different way, it, it, it indicates that the question of the political leadership is crucial. So what, if any, steps or developments are in this area? And finally, what are the main demands the Peruvians want us to organize solidarity around? So thank you very much. I will leave it there. And I want to move very quickly to what I would call un panel de lujo, a deluxe, deluxe panel. I hope they're there, but the first person is Anahi Durand. Is she there? Sí, este, no sé si podrían variar porque tengo problemas ahorita con la conexión. Les escribí por el correo. Yo podría ser la segunda. No problem. Encantado. No hay ningún problema. Can, do we have, we'll, we'll recognize. Te vamos a llamar después si no hay problemas. Vamos a pedir que, que hable entonces Oli Vargas. ¿Está por ahí? Si no está Oli. Eh, Héctor Béjar. Eliana, tiene la primacía. Eliana, you have the primacy to speak before anybody else. Hola. 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 Buen día. Buen día. Eh, Good morning. Prefiero... Let, me, let me introduce you first. Okay. And you are Después... Eliana Carly. Um, uh, sorry, Francisco, if I may also interrupt, please tell everyone that for the Spanish speakers, there is English translation available and they must choose the English translation oh, right. at the bottom of the screen. Choose this preferred language. Eliana speaks English, so I don't think she's got a problem. But... No, I, I do speak English, but obviously I do pre I prefer to speak Spanish if that's an option for me. Yes. But anyways. It is an option. And also uh, our translators request that everybody who needs translation, so especially the Spanish speakers, please speak a little slowly if possible. Yeah. Okay. So do not speak like a Cuban, ever. <laughs> um, so is, is Would... Eliana ready to... Yeah. Okay, let me introduce Eliana Carlin Ronquillo is a political, political scientist, uh, works at the Universidad del Pacifico, and she's co-author of a very interesting book, 20 Peruvian Heroines, where she rescues, you know, the significance of key women throughout the history of Peru that plays a significant role in changing society for the better. She's also a co-founder of one Peruvian Heroines, but also no to Keiko, Keiko Fujimori, of course, the candidate. Um, I've seen Eliana doing several interviews in many places, and you know we are very privileged to have her with us. Eliana, go ahead. The floor is yours. Adelante. Perfecto. Eh, bueno, primero, muchísimas gracias eh, por esta oportunidad de compartir lo que está pasando en en nuestro país. Eh, les mando a todas y todos un saludo desde la ciudad de Lima. Eh, yo eh, he, he preparado algunas notas eh, respecto de la situación que estamos viviendo acá y quisiera pintarles un escenario general sobre la situación y la coyuntura eh, actualmente como para preparar eh, la participación de mis colegas eh, y compañeros en adelante, que son realmente un panel de lujo el que tenemos esta mañana acá. Eh, como sabemos ahora mismo en el Perú, eh, estamos viviendo con una presidenta no electa. Y no solo eh, se trata de una presidenta no electa, sino que se trata de una presidenta que tiene un rechazo popular en absolutamente todas las encuenta, encuestas nacionales que llega al 90% de rechazo. Eh, como sabemos, esto no es sorpresivo si tenemos un régimen que ha causado ya 60 muertos, 50 de los cuales son muertos directamente ocasionados por balas provenientes de las fuerzas públicas. Como esto fue mencionado también previamente en la introducción, esas balas tienen un patrón eh, y han ocurrido de manera predominante en zonas como cabeza, cuello y tórax de nuestros compatriotas. Todos desarmados, todos civiles siete menores de edad y un médico brindando servicios de salud a un herido. 
un, un mecánico de autos que salió a auxiliar a un ciudadano herido que eh, cayó en la puerta de su casa. Este es el tipo de eh, personas que terminaron muertas bajo los primeros días del régimen de Dina Boluarte. Lamentablemente, la presidenta actual, además de normalizar que el Estado quite la vida a las ciudadanas y ciudadanos inocentes, ha tenido la audacia de victimizarse señalando que la oposición en su contra tiene que ver con el hecho de que ella es mujer. Y esto es una falta de respeto sin nombre para todas las mujeres de nuestro país, en especial para las cientos de miles que son víctimas de violencia. El Perú es un país que al día de hoy ha tenido solo en el año 2023 más de 50 feminicidios. Por tanto, las palabras de la presidenta Boluarte, que señala que la oposición hacia ella tiene que ver con su condición de mujer, son inaceptables y las mujeres no lo vamos a permitir. Sobre uno de estos últimos feminicidios, y lamento tener que compartir cosas tan tristes que ocurren en nuestra realidad con ustedes, una joven peruana en sus 20 fue quemada viva en la calle, en el uh, centro de la ciudad de Lima. Solo Elia, a poco... You can speak a little bit slowly, please, for the translator. Of course, I'm sorry, yeah. I tend to speak very quick. It's okay. Quickly. Whatever okay. you can do. Thank you. En uno de los últimos feminicidios tuvimos una mujer eh, peruana que fue quemada viva en el centro de la ciudad, en la mitad del día, solamente a pocas cuadras del Palacio de Gobierno. Ante esta situación, la ministra de la Mujer actual, la ministra de la Mujer de Dina Boluarte, expresó que toca que las mujeres elijamos mejor a nuestras parejas para luego no sufrir eh, ataques, golpes o ser quemadas vivas. En este contexto, además, en que la ciudadanía está en pie de lucha, el actual ministro de Educación, el ministro de Educación de Dina Boluarte, se atrevió a comparar a las mujeres indígenas que protestaban en la ciudad con animales, porque no tenían dónde dejar a sus hijos mientras se acercaban a las protestas. Esto es solamente un ejemplo del tipo de funcionarios públicos de alto nivel en el Poder Ejecutivo que hoy día han tomado por asalto nuestro país y nuestro Estado. Esto es solo un ejemplo de dos declaraciones públicas concretas de dos ministros de Estado. Sin embargo, lamento también tener que informar que cada día hay declaraciones de esta naturaleza que reflejan un desprecio profundo hacia las ciudadanas y ciudadanos de nuestro país. Y esto resulta, por decirlo de alguna manera, curioso, sobre todo porque durante el gobierno de Pedro Castillo, el régimen fue muy duramente criticado por no contar con los denominados ter, eh, técnicos, funcionarios y burócratas profesionales suficientemente preparados y con suficientes cartones eh, desde la perspectiva occidental, por supuesto, para gestionar un ministerio, para gestionar una agencia pública, para gestionar una institución. Es verdad que el partido político con el que entró Pedro Castillo tenía una carencia de técnicos y eso ocasionó, entre otras cosas, cambios con constantes de autoridades en algunas instituciones y, por supuesto, una fiscalización exacerbada eh, que cruzó los límites del obstruccionismo por parte del Congreso de la República y otros organismos. Considero que es pertinente levantar las alertas cuando parece ser que el Estado entra en un momento de inestabilidad. Lo que resulta curioso es que eh, la falta de diplomas o cartones de nuestras autoridades durante el régimen de Pedro Castillo llamó poderosamente la atención de actores políticos, pero decenas de asesinados por parte de las fuerzas del orden no parece llamar la atención 
a estos mismos actores, a estos mismos congresistas, a estos mismos periodistas. ¿Por qué no importan las vidas de estos peruanos? ¿Por qué las vidas de estos peruanos son vistas como vi vidas de ciudadanos de quinta categoría, de última categoría? ¿Por qué? Yo creo que tenemos muchas respuestas. No necesito decir que las críticas orientadas a los funcionarios que trabajaron con Pedro Castillo estuvieron siempre cargadas de un terrible racismo que es muy arraigado en nuestra sociedad, sobre todo desde el statu quo y sobre todo desde las élites limeñas que eh, ahora mismo relativizan los asesinatos de decenas de compatriotas inocentes. Todos estos compatriotas de origen indígena, muchos que no tienen el español como primera lengua o como lengua materna, eh, de las zonas de la sierra, centro y sur del país, que son los compatriotas que terminan siempre ubicándose en fuegos cruzados entre las fuerzas del orden y, en su momento, fuerzas terroristas que también azotaron nuestro país. Siempre los pobladores de estas zonas del país terminan siendo víctimas del Estado. Y esta vez, lamentablemente, no ha sido la excepción. Las críticas que menciono respecto de eh, aquellos que trabajaron para el, para el gobierno de Pedro Castillo, eh, no solamente estuvieron cargadas de un, del racismo estructural eh, que padecemos, sino también del neoliberalismo radical. Para las élites peruanas es absolutamente inaceptable que haya personas indígenas que tengan alguna lógica, algún plan o alguna opinión correcta. Eh, se considera que son poblaciones que al no ser parte del statu quo neoliberal y fujimorista limeño, con, eh, constituyen un enorme riesgo para el país, para el país como lo han construido estas élites, para el Perú, que llevan 200 años en propiedad de estas élites, que no han distribuido desarrollo, no han distribuido bienestar, no han distribuido servicios de calidad, no han distribuido absolutamente nada, pero que sí eh, son muy proactivos al momento de eh, criticar y condenar cuando las poblaciones empobrecidas protestan, cuando las poblaciones empobrecidas levantan la voz, cuando las poblaciones empobrecidas reclaman para sí su estatus de ciudadanos, para ser ciudadanos tan iguales como aquellos que hemos tenido el privilegio de nacer en Lima el privilegio de recibir una educación privada, el privilegio de salir del Perú a estudiar en otros sitios, de hablar otros idiomas y que nos entiendan otras personas. Cuando la ciudadanía empobrecida en el Perú reclama esos derechos para sí, las oligarquías se movilizan y las oligarquías sienten temor de ver temblar sus privilegios, sienten temor de ver los riesgos a sus futuros. Porque finalmente todo este bienestar lamentablemente ha sido construido encima de la opresión de otras poblaciones. Quisiera conversar brevemente ya con ustedes respecto del Congreso de la República. Nosotros tenemos un Congreso unicameral de 130 congresistas. Las protestas que se han despertado alrededor del Perú desde diciembre tienen como una de las consignas principales que se vaya este Congreso de la República, el actual, que se vayan los congresistas actuales, son representantes con más del 90% de rechazo entre la ciudadanía, tal cual como la presidenta de la República. Las protestas están muy orientadas a ellos, lamentablemente no parece ser que ellos escuchen las demandas ciudadanas, y no solamente es un Congreso que hostigó, porque no encuentro otra palabra mejor, hostigó a Pedro Castillo desde el primer día, compuesto por grupos parlamentarios que siguen hasta el día de hoy sin reconocer que Pedro Castillo ganó las elecciones, lo cual es impresionante, siguen negando el resultado electoral, eh, sino que adicionalmente es considerada la institución más corrupta del Perú en, en todas las regiones del país y en todos los grupos de edad en los cuales se aplicó la, la encuesta nacional de la corrupción eh, aplicada, aplicada por Ipsos Perú en octubre del año 2022. 
El Congreso de la República es la institución más corrupta del Perú. Esa institución es la que hoy ha eh, ganado preponderancia por encima del Poder Ejecutivo. Hoy en la práctica tenemos un país que formalmente es un presidencialismo, pero que tiene un parlamentarismo tan exacerbado que ha quitado la posibilidad a los presidentes de culminar con sus mandatos. Tenemos un Congreso que abusa de su mayoría parlamentaria y que acorrala a los presidentes de la República electos de acuerdo a sus propios intereses, que son intereses estrictamente mercantilistas. Ni siquiera se trata de una cuestión legítimamente ideológica o de convicciones políticas o sociales. Se trata aquí de intereses económicos muy profundos y muy arraigados, que se superponen, sí, por supuesto, con el neoliberalismo que todos conocemos, pero que detrás de ellos tiene mafias, tiene el narco, tiene el narcotráfico, tiene la trata de menores, tiene la tala ilegal de recursos de nuestra Amazonía, y eso es una realidad. Son las fuerzas económicas más oscuras las que hoy están moviendo las fichas dentro del Parlamento Nacional. Y en esa situación es que nosotros hemos caído. Podría hablar media hora más sobre la Fiscalía de la Nación. Podría hablar de la Fiscal de la Nación, que es un elemento absolutamente corrupto, colocado por las fuerzas justamente vinculadas al narcotráfico, de lo cual hay evidencia de sobra, que es una tercera pata, una tercera línea de crisis que nos aborda y que ocupa todo nuestro Estado. Y yo diría que eh, en esta coyuntura la protesta social, que lamentablemente has, es, en este momento en el sur sigue manteniéndose, pero en el resto del país es una protesta que está debilitada, es una protesta que se sostiene eh, orgánicamente en recursos económicos propios de la ciudadanía y que por supuesto tratándose de población empobrecida es muy difícil de sostener en el tiempo. Esa diría que es la situación del panorama general que tenemos en nuestro país, solamente como una pequeña introducción eh, para dar pase a mis compañeras y compañeros. Lamento ser portadora de, de una perspectiva tan negativa, pero creo que hay que conocer muy bien la realidad para poder afrontarla y, por supuesto, superarla, porque estoy segura que así va a ser. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, gracias de Eliana. Eh, I'm very sorry, uh, Arnold, that <laughs> put you through some difficult tasks, but I think the main, the key points are quite clear. The situation is stagnant politically, and nobody has resolved any of the crisis. Um, the political situation in, in Peru continues to be one of a massive crisis that, you know, the oligarchy cannot resolve except by exacerbating what they do, which is being more corrupt or being more dictatorial, which is not going to resolve anything. Um, so we'll come back to you with some questions uh, if, once we finish the panel, if that's okay. Um, is Anaí Durán there? Sí, ahora sí. Buenos días. Okay, well, good morning. Buenos días. Uh, you're going to choose the... Vas a elegir la opción en español, ¿no? ¿Empiezo? Tú vas a elegir la opción que te, que te traduzcan al español, ¿no? Sí, sí. Are you in the right? ¿Estás tú en el canal correcto? Sí. Ah, perfecto. Entonces, bueno, déjame presentarte muy rápidamente. Muchas gracias por venir, Anaí, a tomarte el tiempo. Anaí es a, es a former Peruvian Minister of Women and Vulnerable Populations. She's a sociologist. Um, she has produced this excellent article for Labour Outlook in the UK plus of a fantastic video, but also, you know, the work she's done in terms of organizing meetings, events, discussions, panels, of so many. She's very, very busy defending democracy in Peru. Um, Anaí, the floor is yours. Go ahead, please. Sí. Bueno, buenos días. Gracias por, por este espacio. Eh, Anaí, efectivamente, so, Anaí, es que... muy importante para nosotros tener unos espacios uh -huh. de diálogo internacional y dar a conocer lo que está viviendo nuestro país. Anaí, disculpa un, una pequeña interrupción. Y yo quería, eh, bueno, Eliana adelantó algunos temas más. Sí. Solamente te quería decir que cuando hables, hables lento. El, el, parece que el limeño es muy rápido 
Así que si puedes hablar con más lentitud, porque el, el traductor tiene, tiene que seguir el ritmo y no es tan fácil. Pero adelante, tienes tiempo. Muy bien, sí, ya leí el mensaje en el chat, así que voy a, a hablar pausadamente. Sí. A ver, eh, yo quería hacer una exposición que pueda situarnos en el momento que estamos viviendo. Escuché, Liana, ya creo que ya he hecho un marco general bastante eh, acertado. Eh, y también creo que algunos desafíos para la comunidad internacional y especialmente para Canadá, que son fundamentales en estos momentos del régimen, ¿no? Eh, creo que para iniciar ya son cuatro meses desde que Dina Boluarte se instaló en el poder, ¿no? Fue una... Pensé, pensó mucho que podía ser algo más pasajero, ¿no? Que no se iba, que se iba a caer rápidamente, pero lo que hemos visto desde el 8 de diciembre más bien ha sido un esfuerzo restaurador, de restaurar un régimen eh, que estaba amenazado eh, por estos, eh, eh, el gobierno de, de Pedro Castillo, ¿no? Y lo que la derecha creía que podía significar para sus privilegios. Entonces creo que hay que ubicarnos en ese punto, ¿no? Ya transcurrieron, como decía, cuatro meses desde que Dina Boluarte se instaló en Palacio, llegó ahí transconspirar con los partidos que perdieron las elecciones, para ella estar sentada en Palacio, conspiró con esos grupos que perdieron las elecciones, que dijeron fraude, y se alió además con... Eh, con ellos, incluyéndolos incluso en su gabinete, ¿no? Han hecho ahí una alianza bastante débil, la verdad, pero que es la que está gobernando, ¿no? Y además, eh, en coalición, digamos, con los otros poderes del Estado, el Ejecutivo, la Fiscalía, el Poder Judicial, las Fuerzas Armadas y Policiales, que son el brazo operativo en el caso de protesta, y sobre todo el Congreso de la República, ¿no? Que efectivamente ha ido ganando cada vez más protagonismo y tiende a convertirnos en un régimen parlamentarista. ¿no? Entonces, ese es un poco el escenario que tenemos actualmente. ¿no? Eh, también son cuatro meses que, ha, de, de que hemos vivido eh, una movilización popular muy importante. ¿no? Yo creo que contra los cálculos que tenía la derecha a los pocos días de que Dina Boluarte se instaló en Palacio sin ser elegida para ello, y además habiéndose comprometido a renunciar en caso de la destitución de Pedro Castillo, eh, hubo un estallido popular muy grande, muy masivo, que se extendió además en todo el país. ¿no? Yo me atrevería a decir que es el más importante de los últimos 50 años. ¿no? Una masividad muy grande y una cohesión muy grande también en la plataforma de lucha. ¿no? La renuncia de Dina Boluarte, el cierre del Congreso, la nueva Constitución y la libertad para Pedro Castillo. ¿no? Ha sido un estallido popular muy grande, como digo, muy masivo, eh, muy político también, no quiere decir que no hayan habido protestas antes en el Perú, pero este nivel de conciencia política y de articulación de demandas políticas es algo que no lo habíamos visto, ¿no? Obviamente la represión ha sido brutal, tenemos más de 60 personas asesinadas directamente ya con necropsias establecidas por eh, balas, eh, objetos... Eh, perdigones, en fin, por las fuerzas policiales y militares, hay 1.300 heridos ahorita en distintos hospitales del Perú y 1.800 personas encausadas judicialmente, de las cuales la amistad está en prisión, sobre todo en Puno, en Ica, en Juliaca, en eh, Arequipa, en Cusco. ¿no? Eh, si bien ahora la intensidad de las protestas ha bajado, la población eh, continúa resistente. ¿no? Hay distintos niveles de, de, de resistencia, ¿no? Es un escenario muy complejo, ¿no? Los sectores conservadores están empeñados en mantener este poder, ¿no? Parecen llevar la ofensiva, pero los sectores populares no se rinden tampoco, ¿no? Eh, eso para, para empezar, y quiero hacer énfasis, por un lado, en esta ofensiva restituyente que está llevando adelante Dina Boluarte para salvar el modelo neoliberal que está en crisis ya hace bastante tiempo, eh, en decadencia económica, política, ya no es capaz de generar una gobernabilidad eh, y estabilidad, ¿no? Eh, eso por un lado, y luego, para terminar también un poco una mirada a, al campo popular que se está movilizando, ¿no? Entonces, eh, ¿cómo va esta ofensiva restituyente? ¿Qué está haciendo Dina Boluarte y sus aliados para salvar el modelo? Eh, pues en primer lugar están, como decía Armando, una coalición ¿no? que tiene como objetivo además salvar ese modelo que, se, que lo impuso Alberto Fujimori en el 92, 
que se legitimó en una constitución, la Constitución Política del Perú del 93, que aprueba en, en, se aprueba en media de la dictadura fujimorista, y que pone las pautas fundamentales de, para organizar la economía, la política y la sociedad. ¿no? Esto ha entrado en crisis y justamente la destitución de Castillo y la brutalidad con la que imponen a Dina Boluarte reflejan esta desesperación de las élites por salvar el modelo, ¿no? Un modelo que además en lo económico ha sido sumamente extractivista, ese es el corazón del modelo, ¿no? Permitiendo eh, beneficiar a transnacionales y élites minoritarias, ¿no? Eh, ese régimen ya estuvo en crisis en el 2001, pero la transición de esa época prefirió deshacerse de Alberto Fujimori y mantener in intacto el modelo, ¿no? Eh, ahora lo que hemos visto es que están dispuestos a, a todo, digamos, la, la, la brutalidad, como decía, la verdad nos ha impactado mucho esta fuerza represiva que ha tenido el ejército y la policía, no habíamos visto ese nivel de violencia desde la época del fujimorismo, quizá eh, eh, de una jornada de 18 asesinados en Juliaca, de 10 asesinados en Ayacucho, eh, muy de una forma muy, muy brutal, ¿no? Además, eh, con el discurso criminalizador de que eran terroristas, eh, minería ilegal, tal e ilegal, que eran todos delincuentes, ¿no? Cuando lo que se veía era que era un, una población indignada que estaba reclamando porque su, eh, su voto tuviera sentido, ¿no? Contra un régimen que se estaba imponiendo. Pero bueno, esa, creo que esa cara represiva de esta ofensiva restauradora nos da una idea de cómo están buscando quedarse, ¿no? Pero no solamente eh, quieren quedarse con la fuerza bruta, ¿no? También es importante ahí eh, todo lo que están haciendo para asegurarse eh, con maniobras legales desde el Congreso eh, cierto control de los organismos electorales, ¿no? Esto me parece fundamental porque ellos tienen la mayoría en el Congreso, el Congreso sigue funcionando como si no pasara nada a pesar de su baja legitimidad y su escasa aprobación, y están justamente buscando cambiar eh, a los miembros de la, la, de la OMPE, de la Oficina de Procesos Electorales, del Jurado Nacional Electoral, y eh, viendo cómo hacen ellos para eh, maniobrar esto y asegurarse un escenario más controlado en, en el caso de unas futuras elecciones. ¿no? Y esto tiene que ver también con cómo están... Eh, viendo a la oposición, ahorita en estos momentos, si bien la represión más brutal ha cedido, lo que tenemos es una judicialización y una criminalización enorme. No hay garantías de participación democrática. Si se convocan nuevas elecciones mañana, va a haber una cantidad de líderes sociales judicializados y criminalizados que no van a poder participar. Lo mismo con los ex ministros y los líderes políticos vinculados al presidente Castillo, que están afrontando una serie de procesos, por ejemplo, por rebelión, por eh, este supuesto golpe, en fin, hay una situación de persecución de la oposición que no está brindando garantías democráticas, ¿no? Eh, y lo mismo eh, también están operando con el caso de la fiscal de la nación, ¿no? Que ellos están muy activos en poder eh, llevar adelante estos juicios, estas carpetas fiscales que le permiten al régimen eh, trabajar también con esta papa, ¿no? Por un lado, eh, reprimes si hay protesta, por otro lado, judicializas, criminalizas con la fiscalía y el Poder Judicial, inhabilitas a la oposición, y finalmente cambias las reglas del juego con el Congreso en el cual tienes mayoría, ¿no? Entonces, ese es un poco el escenario que ellos han, se están desenvolviendo para volver a concentrar el poder, ¿no? Eh, no tienen todas las de ganar, eso creo que hay que decirlo, hay tres factores que son importantes, creo la enorme falta de legitimidad que tienen, la ciudadanía lo sigue rechazando, eh, no pueden salir, Dina Boluarte no puede salir de Palacio, eso lo, lo comentaba Eliana también, eh, es una falta de legitimidad en tanto una incapacidad de generar un consenso mínimo, ¿no? Ellos no, eh, no están gobernando fuera de él, ¿no? Y eh, eso es algo que también los, los sigue desgastando, ¿no? Además, eh, y esto es otro tema fundamental en la viabilidad del régimen y en sus intenciones de quedarse, el tema económico, ¿no? Desde enero Perú está registrando una caída en el crecimiento económico, ¿no? Justamente la calificadora de alto riesgo Fitch decía que ya la inestabilidad política y la emergencia climática por el ciclón que hemos vivido estaban impactando 
negativamente en la macroeconomía peruana, que siempre se ponía como un ejemplo. Y finalmente, eh, un tercer elemento que creo que hay que tener en cuenta para los planes que tiene esta coalición conservadora, es las propias contradicciones que tienen entre ellos, ¿no? Es, no son un bloque homogéneo. Dina Boluarte ha sido puesta ahí para que haga el trabajo sucio, pero en cualquier momento la sacan. Lo que hemos visto esta semana con un escándalo de un narcotraficante vinculado al fujimorismo, apenas el ministro de Justicia quiere avanzar en algo, ya el Congreso amenaza con vacancia. Entonces hay una debilidad en esa coalición que está gobernando. Comparte un objetivo común, que es salvar el modelo neoliberal, quedarse ahí, acallar la oposición, no arriesgarse a que le surja otro Pedro Castillo, pero eh, tienen estas debilidades también. Y finalmente, eh, el tema internacional, ¿no? Boluarte solo ha conseguido, en el caso de América Latina, el apoyo de Ecuador, de Uruguay y de Estados Unidos, ¿no? De, desde fuera. Bueno, con Canadá también hay un tema que luego voy a retomar, pero en el caso de Latinoamérica, salvo Ecuador y Uruguay, tiene un aislamiento muy grande, ¿no? Y de hecho una, un protagonismo muy fuerte de México y Colombia que han sido claves para denunciar la ilegitimidad del régimen. Entonces, esto para hacernos una idea de ese, de ese bloque, de esa coalición restauradora que está buscando salvar el modelo y quedarse aún con toda esta situación ilegítima, eh, ¿Cómo ha respondido la población? Y esta era la otra parte que quería comentar, ¿no? Eh, los sectores populares han salido a manifestarse muy masivamente, muy cohesionados en la plataforma, pero también con una debilidad orgánica bastante grande, ¿no? O sea, se han politizado, como decía, yo creo que estos 15 meses de gobierno de, de, de Pedro Castillo politizaron mucho a la población en términos antagónicos, ¿no? Atacan al presidente de tal una forma racista, clasista, y por lo tanto también me están atacando a mí, que yo voté por este presidente. Eh, y creo que eso ayudó a politizar una sociedad que estaba bastante despolitizada, fragmentada, eh, y aparece ahora eh, en las calles reclamando eh, con un sentido histórico, además, bastante importante, ¿no? Lo que se decía mucho, sobre todo en el surandino, que ha sido el epicentro de la protesta, ¿no? No es el 7 de diciembre, son 200 años, ¿no? Esta, esta demanda de un nuevo momento en la República eh, Peruana. ¿no? Entonces, ha habido diferentes escenarios, diferentes intensidades, ¿no? Diciembre y enero son los meses en el que el estallido es masivo y sobre todo tiene el epicentro en el sur y la Amazonía. Luego, las, de las masacres se decide sobre, sobre todo las comunidades, son las que deciden, las comunidades indígenas deciden venir a Lima, vemos desplazamientos de miles de camiones, camionetas, buses que llegan a Lima con eh, manifestantes que vienen a protestar a la, a la capital y, eh, y están aquí, encuentran una, un escenario muy hostil, si bien la gente de Lima también se suma a, a las protestas lo que encuentran sobre todo es represión, ¿no? Ya en el Perú no se respeta el derecho a la protesta. Apenas se juntan 500 ciudadanos, la policía interviene de una manera brutal, con gases lacrimógenos, con eh, represión. Entonces, esa, esa ha sido un poco la situación, ¿no? La, la población que llegó a, a, la, a Lima, sobre todo, a hacer escuchar su voz, eh, ha regresado a sus regiones, se está revaluando también la... La, la continuidad de las protestas, ¿no? Hay debilidades también en el campo popular, más allá de toda la fuerza con la que han salido. Sigue habiendo una gran fragmentación, ¿no? Una región decide una medida, la otra región decide otra, y así sucesivamente. Hay la ausencia de liderazgos nacionales, no hay un liderazgo nacional que en estos momentos pueda decir yo articulo esta protesta, la llevo por acá o por otro lado, no, eh, este, no hay esa legitimidad de ningún liderazgo nacional, eh, y también pues, hay una desarticulación territorial grande, no, no hay un solo espacio que pueda eh, llevar a cabo esta coordinación, y una desconexión muy grande también con los eh, gremios y sindicatos existentes. ¿no? Esta, esta, estas grandes movilizaciones que hemos vivido tiene una distancia enorme con las centrales sindicales que más bien han quedado rezagadas y, y marginalizadas. ¿no? Eh, eh, bueno, lo mismo que los partidos políticos, ¿no? La izquierda al final eh, es 
ha quedado pactando en el Congreso para no adelantar las elecciones, eh, siguen también jugando un poco a la sobrevivencia, eh, no hay un partido que pueda ahorita representar ese, eh, en el terreno político electoral esta indignación que está en curso. ¿no? Eh, eso entonces creo que además es fundamental entender esta, esta, este carácter restaurador, esta necesidad para las élites nacionales de salvar el modelo y asegurar negocios finalmente, ¿no? Lo que vimos en marzo, en marzo, el 8 de marzo, si no me equivoco, Alberto Tarola, que es el premier de Dina Boluarte, su primer ministro, eh, que además fue ministro de defensa cuando fueron las masacres en Apurímac y Ayacucho, donde se asesinaron a 20 personas, incluyendo seis menores de edad, viajó a Canadá, creo que había el foro minero, ¿no? Y él dijo ahí que se comprometía a desbloquear todos los corredores mineros, porque claro, una de las medidas de protesta eh, que usaron los manifestantes fue bloquear en las carreteras que, que conectan los, los centros mineros, ¿no? Estaban bloqueadas, la población las había bloqueado, y él fue a Canadá a comprometerse, muchas de estas minas obviamente son de capitales canadienses, a desbloquear la, el corredor minero, y claro, la, 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 lo que usó fue militarizar. Tenemos casi el 70% del país en estado de emergencia y militarizado para desbloquear la principal, el principal corredor minero que saca el mineral eh, cobre, sobre todo de Apurima, que en el surandino que está tomado por los, eh, las comunidades indígenas de la zona, se militarizó. Entonces, ahorita, como decía, más de la mitad del país se encuentra militarizada, y ese fue un compromiso de Alberto Tarola en Canadá, ¿no? Eh, claro, él dijo con respeto a los derechos humanos, pero ya vemos que no se están respetando los derechos humanos, ¿no? Además, eh, no solamente fue a garantizar que se iba a liberar el corredor minero, sino fue a ofrecer minerales estratégicos que tiene el Perú, que han sido parte de la discusión los, los últimos años, como es el litio, ¿no? El litio está ahorita, creo que es una empresa canadiense, eh, Yellow Cake, no sé, algo así, eh, y eso es, está además en una zona que ha sido el epicentro de la protesta, el yacimiento de litio que tiene el Perú, ¿no? Eh, donde han habido 18 peruanos asesinados en Puno, en la frontera con Bolivia, y es casi una provocación anunciar que se va a iniciar el trabajo de explotación y exploración en esa zona, ¿no? Un gobierno ilegítimo, ¿no? no puede, eh, no tiene la, 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 digamos, la facultad, o sea, puede tenerla en el papel, pero cuando hay un gobierno legítimo estas decisiones se pueden desconocer, ¿no? Entonces creo que sí es muy peligroso lo que están haciendo ellos en términos de ofertar y rematar recursos naturales, que como decía, finalmente el objetivo de la restauración es seguir ese modelo. Y creo que es importante que la sociedad civil canadiense, la sociedad política canadiense, que está comprometida con los derechos humanos, con la democracia, eh, tengo una mirada crítica de lo que está haciendo el gobierno peruano. O sea, es un gobierno absolutamente ilegítimo. Legalidad puede tener, ¿no? Que es la sucesión constitucional, que hay un nivel ahí de legalidad, seguro. Pero legitimidad no la tiene. O sea, para empezar, las denuncias ya están en, en la ONU, ¿no? En la, en la, eh, tiene creo que hasta el 24 de abril para responder 60 puntos sobre los asesinatos, las masacres y las... Eh, los heridos que tenemos ahorita sobre las garantías democráticas porque digo, ya yo creo personalmente que la represión más brutal pasó, o sea, un día con 20 peruanos asesinados quizá va a ser difícil que vuelva a haber en el corto plazo pero lo que está viniendo ahora es el otro lado, es la judicialización la criminalización, la in inhabilitación a la oposición entonces, si pedimos nuevas elecciones, <ríe> ellos van a ganar, entonces es, es un escenario muy muy difícil y reitero, reitero que eh, es importante que, que la sociedad civil internacional, que la comunidad internacional sea menos condescendiente, ¿no? Que este señor Otárola haya ido a Canadá a prometer la militarización, a, a, digamos, a legitimar la militarización del territorio, a ofertar el litio peruano en condiciones de tanta eh, conflictividad, es preocupante, ¿no? Entonces yo quería compartir esto con ustedes eh, y bueno, podemos seguir conversando después. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Anadí, excelente. I was just saying that, you know, we had a panel de lujo. 
Uh, clearly, what we need to do is to add the demand that the freeing of all prisoners is the, absolutely essential. Um, the second thing we need to add is the persecution of the position should be stopped because it's illegal. It's lawfare, you know, of the worst kind that, you know, Latin Americans and others practice. But also, I think a very crucial demand in terms of solidarity is the question of the end of the militarization of Peru. We don't want to go back to Fujimori. And, you know, we should use that as effective as it can. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I for that. I'm sure people have questions um, about this. Um, I take it that Hector is not there. Is Oli uh, available? If he's not, then we should move straight to Ben. Is Ben available? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hi. Let me introduce you, uh, Ben. Thank you for attending and coming to our meeting. Um, the information I have is generally editor of the Geopolitical Economy Report, which is very mean because I think he's much more than that. If anybody wants to have journalism of the best quality, journalism which is informative, rigorous, and based on serious research, particularly with a geopolitical mind, you know, when you get the details, that is Ben. So we benefit from Ben's analysis and commentary every time he does something. Welcome, Ben. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Can you hear me? Today, I want to talk about Peru as a laboratory for a new kind of coup that we've seen that the United States has sponsored in countries around the world. The character of the coups that Washington has sponsored over the decades has shifted in the 20th century, particularly in the earlier half, the, the, la the former half, and in the mid 20th century, the U.S. carried out a lot of blatant military coups, you know, the, the more famous examples being, uh, for instance, against Mossadegh in, in 1953, against in Iran against Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954. And then one of the most infamous, of course, being the 1973 CIA coup against Salvador Allende in Chile, in which the military dictator Augusto Pinochet physically overthrew the government, bombed the presidential palace, and Allende was killed in the process. Now, in the past 50 years, 40, I would say, really, especially the past 30 years, but really since the 1980s, the United States has tried to develop new forms of coups. Obviously, the previous coups that Washington had supported were very blatant and did reputational damage to the image of the U.S. empire around the world. So especially in the 1980s, with the creation of institutions like the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a CIA cutout, and other U.S. Um, government organizations like the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, the United States has perfected the art of color revolutions. And we saw many of those in former members of the Soviet Union after the, the overthrow of the Soviet Union in 1991. And in fact, many of these organizations were involved in the overthrow of the Soviet Union. This was acknowledged in the Washington Post in an article that discusses what they call the spyless coups, which, I mean, they still have spies. They just maybe, instead of working directly for the CIA, they work for NGOs and cutouts funded by the U.S. So we've seen a, a shift in the character of U.S. coups. And the, the, the coup against Pedro Castillo in Peru in December of 2022, I think is a good example of this new character of these coups that is not directly in the same way that Pinochet overthrew Allende, it cannot directly be called a military coup, but it absolutely was a coup. I mean, first of all, we should keep in mind that the so-called ambassador of the United States in Peru, Lisa Kenna, is a CIA veteran. And there's a, a joke that has been said for many years, there's no such thing as a former CIA agent. Lisa Kenna, the U.S. ambassador in Peru, admitted when she submitted her bio to the, the State Department, um, excuse me, to the Congress in the United States when she was being considered as a candidate when Donald Trump appointed her 
uh, nominated her to be U.S. ambassador to Peru, she had to get congressional approval. And in the official biography that she gave, her State Department biography that she gave to Congress, she acknowledged that at least officially she worked for the CIA for nine years and then worked in the State Department. And she worked in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, that were under military occupation. So we know that the CIA and the State Department have a revolving door. Mike Pompeo, who was Donald Trump's secretary of state, previously was director of the CIA. Just, I mean, getting rid of any pretense of independence between those institutions. And we know that one day before the coup against Pedro Castillo, which I'll discuss in a second, Lisa Kenna, the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador, met with the defense minister of Peru and said very clearly, uh, the defense minister said very clearly on the day of the coup against Castillo, he told the military to disobey the elected president's orders. Now, there's been a lot of misinformation about this, um, essentially arguing that Pedro Castillo is the one who tried to launch a coup, not mentioning that Article 134 of the Peruvian Constitution, I'm going to read it here, says the president of the republic is authorized to dissolve the Congress if it has censured or denied its confidence to two councils of ministers. The Council of Minister in Peru is the official name for the cabinet. That, that's the cabinet of ministers. And this des this uh, dissolution decree contains the call for new, for elections for a new Congress. Now, this is exactly what Pedro Castillo did to the letter of the law. When he tried to dissolve the Congress in December, <laughs> he, he immediately said that they were going to have new elections for a Congress and they were going to have a constituent assembly. This was one of Pedro Castillo's main uh, issues that he ran on when he campaigned for president because in Peru, the country still suffers with a constitution that was written by an actual dictatorship of Alberto Fujimori. Now, the golpistas, the right-wing coup plotters in Peru, accused Castillo, the victim of a coup, of trying to launch a coup. Well, in reality, what they're defending is a constitutional system, which is, which is completely anti-democratic and right-wing, that was created by an actual dictator, Alberto Fujimori, went after he dissolved the Congress against the Constitution. Ironically, what Pedro Castillo was doing was entirely constitutional, according to the very same Fujimorista Constitution that he wanted to change. Whereas when Fujimori successfully dissolved the Congress with the support of the military, unlike Castillo, who did not have the support of the military. I've never heard, by the way, of a president launching a coup without the support of the military. And we can see that after Pedro Castillo constitutionally tried to dissolve the, the Congress to hold new elections, the military arrested him and Pedro Castillo was sentenced to 18 months in preventative prison, in scare quotes, without due process, without a fair trial. So he is a political prisoner. Now, the Fujimorista constitution was also written with the direct input of U.S. officials and neoliberal economists. And the Peruvian constitution is a poster child for the, the Washington consensus. It was written by Chicago boys, and it's exactly what the United States would like to impose on the rest of the world. It is a textbook neoliberal constitution that basically prevents the elected leadership from implementing a popular economic program to develop the country. So the United States claims that Pedro Castillo was supposedly violating Peruvian democracy. And yet here we see that the United States is propping up this regime that has absolutely no democratic legitimacy. And I wanna quickly go through the most recent poll from one of the leading polling firms in Peru. Now, this was conducted by the Institute for Peruvian Studies, the IEP. Ironically, the Institute for Peruvian Studies is backed by a who's who of Western neoliberal organizations. If you go to their website and and look at who their funders are, I mean, it's actually pretty cartoonish. What I mean, we're talking about the Open Society Organization, the World Bank, uh, many different Western government institutions like from Canada, USAID, which is a CIA cutout. I mean, th these are the Western imperialist organizations that fund the Instituto de Estudios Peruanos, the Institute of Peruvian Studies that conducted this poll. And yet they acknowledge the fact that the Peruvian coup regime that was not elected by the Peruvian people 
has 91% disapproval that Congress, that is, this is a unicameral Congress, the, the institution that launched the coup against Castillo, it has 91% disapproval and 6% approval and 3% of people. So they don't, they don't know. So this is, this is a textbook example of an authoritarian regime that is anti-democratic. Similarly, for the unelected current leader, Dina Boluarte, who never participated in an election, never got votes to be president. Yes, she was vice president under Castillo, but a year before the coup, she left the left-wing Peru Libre party of Pedro Castillo, and she said that she never believed in the party's ideology. So she has always been a right-wing Trojan horse. And she has 78% disapproval and 15% approval, according to the study. Again, this is by an organization that was antagonistic to Pedro Castillo. The IAP represents the Peruvian bourgeoisie. I mean, they're not the voice of the Peruvian working class. And they acknowledge that this regime is completely illegitimate and undemocratic. Now, what's also interesting is if you look at the the division of rural versus urban areas in Peru, you find that there is a little more support for Boluarte, the unelected president in, in urban areas, especially in the Lima metropolitan area. But even then, we're talking about less, fewer than one fifth of Peruvians who live in the Lima metropolitan area. So within Lima, which is, of course, is the wealthiest part of the country and the neoliberal governments that have ruled Peru for decades, have essentially uh, only developed Lima and abandoned the rural areas. And maybe a few cities have had some development, but even in the richest area in Peru and Lima, only 18% of Peruvians support Boluarte, whereas 72% of Peruvians in Lima oppose her. In other urban areas and other major cities, just 14% of Peruvians support Boluarte and 80% oppose her. And in rural areas, which has been the rural areas have been the base of the resistance, of the mass protests against this coup regime. And more than 60 people in Peru have been killed in this violent repression carried out by the Peruvian coup regime. By the way, using uh, materiel and uh, tear gas and weapons provided by the United States. And in the rural areas whose um, populations have suffered because of this coup regime, just 11% of Peruvians support Boluarte and 81% disapprove of her. Now, what's also interesting is among the very few people in Peru, the small handful of the Peruvian bourgeoisie who do support Boluarte, one of the more sophisticated arguments they've given is that, you know, she represents Peruvian women and this is a step forward for feminism, which is a complete disgrace to the actual feminists in Peru who are being killed. Many of them are protesting and they're being killed and their loved ones are being killed by the Peruvian junta. Meanwhile, uh, the irony is that this study shows that just 11 percent of Peruvian women support Boluarte and 79 percent of, of Peruvian women oppose Boluarte. Ironically, Boluarte, the supposed feminist icon, has more support among Peruvian men, although, again, just 18 percent of Peruvian men, as opposed to 76 percent of um, Peruvian men who, who oppose her. So the point is that this is a, a, an undemocratic regime that has absolutely no legitimacy. And yet I think when something that's interesting about this development, uh, I mentioned that the character of these coups has shifted over time. Now, there was a, there was a military element of this coup. The military disobeyed the constitutional president's orders and arrested him. And that was before, by the way, the Congress had this this vote to to impeach uh, Pedro Castillo. And this is a legacy of the Fujimorista con Constitution written by the Fujimori dictatorship, which, by the way, carried out genocide that was funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development. There are documents from the U.S. from USAID discussing how the U.S. under the Clinton administration gave millions of dollars to fund Peru's so-called family planning program, and they boasted. And actually, there, to its shame, there was a UN, uh, a United Nations conference that was organized on family planning around the world. And to its shame, they boasted of the Fujimori regime's family planning plan, which actually involved the sterilization of around 300,000 Peruvians, the vast majority women of indigenous descent. 
And many of them were sterilized against their will. That they, they, were, they did not know they were going to be sterilized. Anyway, the point is that the Fujimori regime in the Constitution, it turned the Congress into a unicameral uh, system. And, uh, and according to this system, if the Peruvian Congress can get a two-thirds majority vote, they can overthrow the elected president if they de deem them to be morally incapable, physically or morally incapable. Clearly, that's a term that's very ambiguous. It can mean anything. So what this means is that according to the Fujimorista Constitution, all the Congress has to do is get a majority vote and they can overthrow the elected president. Now, what's interesting about that is, yes, Peru do has had six presidents in the past five years, which is which is a testament to the undemocratic nature of this ridiculous system. However, uh, Castillo survived two other congressional coup attempts compared to other leaders who had not done so when he tried the day he was dissolving Congress constitutionally to hold new elections. It was the third congressional coup attempt against him. Now, what's also an important detail about this is that uh, I mentioned that this is kind of a new character, a new kind of strategy in these coups. I would say that one of the more similar coups that we've seen backed by the United States would, in fact, be a coup that happened in April of 2022 against Pakistan's democratically elected prime minister, Imran Khan, in which we have photographic evidence showing the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan meeting with members of the parliament, clearly whipping votes to get enough votes to overthrow Imran Khan through basically the same process of a kind of parliamentary coup. And Imran Khan himself has said that he had evidence that the U.S. Uh, embassy was working behind the scenes to whip votes, conspiring with the parliament to overthrow him. And there are public statements made by the Assistant Secretary of State for uh, for South Asia, Donald Liu, who also said that the United States was very angry with Imran Khan, particularly because one, he did not tolerate the U.S. to have military bases and particularly drone bases. Two, because he had had rapprochement with Russia and actually Imran Khan was in Moscow on the day that Putin initiated special military operation. He didn't know that was going to happen, but he refused to condemn Russia. Anyway, the point is there, there are a lot of factors, but the point is that the congressional coup against Imran Khan has a lot of similarities with the congressional coup against uh, Pedro Castillo in Peru. Both countries now are governed by completely undemocratic military regimes with a civilian face. But in both countries, the civilian face basically controls nothing. Boluarte is not the real power. The real power is the military and the head of the Congress, Jose Williams, who himself is a former commander of the military who oversaw war crimes. And, and there's many reports showing that he is linked to drug trafficking. And similarly, in Pakistan, it's the military that's in charge. And the, the, the General Bajwa, the commander of the military, visited Washington recently to meet with top officials. It was not the so-called Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, who was being investigated, investigated for corruption. The face of that regime is Bajwa. So and these, these coups are very similar, and it's worth studying both of them. But what I want to end it here with is talk about a positive note. Um, it's very easy to be, be um, you know, very depressed. I mean, there have been massive protests in Peru, which do inspire confidence. The Peruvian people have not tolerated this uh, ridiculous imported government, to, to use the term that Imran Khan has used in Pakistan. But I, I want to briefly look at a map of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean who have rebelled against this coup and have referred to it as a coup. I, I over at geopoliticaleconomy.com, I made this map of countries that have whose leaders have expressed support for Pedro Castillo. Now, this, I think, does represent a historic shift, whereas at the peak of Plan Condor, Operation Condor, in which in the 1960s and 70s, up until the 1980s, the United States backed a, a series of fascist military dictatorships across South America. A at the peak of Plan Condor, the left was marginalized and exiled and murdered and imprisoned across these countries. But now what we see is the majority of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean have left-wing governments, and they have actually publicly spoken out against this coup. This includes the most populous countries in the region, excluding Brazil. Now, unfortunately, Lula, uh, when he was not president when the coup happened in Peru 
it was still uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who himself had come to power because of U.S.-backed coups in 2016 and 2018 against Dilma and Lula, respectively, and the imprisonment of Lula and fake charges that were later dropped by the Supreme Court. And the U.N. Human Rights Committee has said that his political and civil rights were violated. But anyway, the point is that um, excluding uh, Lula, who has not commented on it as president, and I think that's unfor it's unfortunate, but um, he also hasn't supported the, the Peruvian coup regime. But excluding Brazil, the largest countries in the region, the most populous countries, including Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, and also Bolivia, have supported Pedro Castillo. In the case of Mexico, the second most populous country in the region with the second biggest economy, eh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, the Mexican president, has been very outspoken in support of Castillo, saying that he should not be in prison, that it violates his rights and he should be freed. In the case of Colombia, the new left-wing president, the first ever left-wing president, Colombia Gustavo Petro, has been outspoken in support of Castillo and has said that Castillo was the victim of a coup, comparing it to the 1973 CIA coup against Salvador Allende in Chile. And similarly, uh, in Bolivia, we've seen very strong statements from both the president, Luis Arce, and the former president, Evo Morales. Um, and of course, in Venezuela, uh, Nicolas Maduro, the constitutional president, has likewise spoken out against what he is referred to as a coup. And in Argentina, the words have not been as uh, you know, outspoken. Uh, he, they have not referred to it as a coup. However, uh, the president, Alberto Fernandez, has said very clearly that uh, that that uh, Pedro Castillo was illegally imprisoned and should be freed. And I should mention that uh, Mexico, Argentina uh, and Colombia published a joint statement in which they condemned the imprisonment of uh, Castillo and said he should be freed. Now, uh, Nicaragua's Sandinista government has openly referred to it as a coup. And another welcome development is the new left-wing president of Honduras, uh, Samara Castro. She has been very outspoken, honestly, probably the most outspoken of all. Her government from the week of the coup in December referred to it as a coup. And I think the reason for that is very clear. Her husband, Manuel Celaya, and political ally of her Libre Party, the left-wing party, was a victim of a U.S.-backed coup in 2009. And of course, Cuba has, has always been a very honorable um, support, has always been a, a, the leading voice of support uh, for the left in the region and has always opposed the right-wing coups in the region. And multiple countries in the Caribbean as well have spoken out. So what I, wh I'm going to end with that, but what, what I think that reflects is there has been a shift in the region. Now, in Peru, for a variety of historical reasons, the the left has been a very weak, largely because it was exterminated under the Fujimori dictatorship. It was quite literally exterminated physically, um, and it was never able to really recover. But uh, despite the weakness of the Peruvian left, the Peruvian right is also completely illegitimate. And in the last elections, there were not there was not one but two significant left wing presidential candidates. So if there were to be a legitimate election in Peru, it's very possible that the left could win again, which is a reflection of the fact that uh, the left across Latin America is on the rise and imperialism is in fundamental crisis around the world. And the U.S. empire is now resorting to, I mean, the U.S. is one of the only countries in the Americas that supports this completely illegitimate regime in Peru. It's the U.S. and Canada and Guatemala, the, the right wing corrupt regime in Guatemala and, and Chile, who is another victory of U.S. imperialism, the, uh, an attempt to divide the left. And you have the NGO, uh, you know, uh, the NGO neoliberal left in Chile. But excluding them, I mean, this I, I cannot think of an example in recent Latin American history in which there has been such widespread opposition to what was clearly a coup. So that that is re reason for optimism. Thank you very much, Ben. As I threaten you with excellent, very geopolitical, very thorough, um, you know, research base and quite interesting. Uh, just to say that. The United States was obviously involved. I remember, as a matter of anecdotes, 
Yeah, Michelle Bachelet was interviewed on national television in the United States once. She was not the president any longer. And she asked the question to the journalist, said, do you know why there are no coup d'etat in the United States? And the reporter came back to say, well, it's because of the strength of our institutions, our democracy. And so, no, 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 she said, it's because you do not have a US embassy <laughs> in US territory. But anyway, thank you very much, Ben. Um, this is the last call for Oli or Hector. I take it they're not here. So um, I think we're open for questions, but I will take two or three max, if that's OK. Because uh, our speakers have been, you know, doing an excellent job. Can I start by asking one question, perhaps to Eliana and to, to uh, you have to? Alan wants to make an announcement. Remember? Yeah, no, I was going to do after the questions, if that's okay. Or okay. shall shall we have it now? Okay, in that case, Alan, please. Uh, there is an interesting announcement. You, Alan. Hi, um, can you can you can you guys hear me? Yeah, because I've been on the Spanish channels. <laughs> no soy seguro que se me oye o no. Entonces, a, a very simple message. How can you make sure that this activity that we're now engaged in, rallying people by informing them about what is happening in places like Peru, is maintained? And that is to support us by helping us and to support us financially. And I'm just going to show you the simple way that you can do the financial support and then talk you through, it won't take long, um, how you can volunteer and be one of the team that is doing these things. So let me first of all see if I can get to, um, do bear with me while I get to the, the key place. Share. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you can see this. This is, um, I hope so, yeah. This is one of our videos, which you'll see on YouTube. This one will be available on YouTube, thanks to the excellent work of Paul Graham. Within a day, I, I solemnly predict, and there will be in two versions, Spanish, which I'm now recording, and English. And if you go to a YouTube typical of what we produce, you'll see at the bottom here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, there's a little thing that says how many views there have been, and then it says show more. So you click on the show more, you scroll down and you'll see a Patreon link and you'll see a PayPal link and you'll see a link to the International Manifesto Group website, which is the main website that organizes this. There are others, but that's all you need to know about. Let me just show you where the Patreon link takes you. Very simple. This is, this is how many people are now giving us money and how much that there is. Now, what do we need? In addition to the money that we get per month from our Patreon subscribers, not much, $67, because when we started, we didn't think much about how to finance ourselves. And now we've grown a lot and we need to. Um, to that, I would add that we receive around about $200 a month in PayPal regular donations, and we receive, thankfully, some occasional quite large donations. But it's the small donations, it's the $10, $20, maybe $5, if that's so you can all afford, that repeat every month that are vital. So we need to get that total figure up to about $1,000 Canadian dollars a month. It's even less in US dollars, or at least currently. And it's very simple. For example, if everybody here was to contribute $10 a month, we would do it. We'd cover our costs. We wouldn't have to rely on each month. Do those big donations come in or not? Can we continue to send you mailings? Can we continue to host the webinars? And so on. So come here, click on become a patron. And there's a couple of steps. But basically, what you do is you choose a card, you put that in and you say how much you want to how much you want to pay each month so that that's one way to help us the other way which i hope i can do by just retreating back along my breadcrumbs no it doesn't work like that okay let's try something else oh 
I'm trying to get you to the donate page of our International Manifesto group without success. Here we go. Click on this um, or at, and you're taken to the donate page of our website. And again, you can either get to Patreon or you can get to PayPal. Now, we are aware that there are many problems with PayPal, and we will be substituting that for a different payment system, which is Palestine friendly for a start, which PayPal is not, and which is also special specializes in not for profits, and that's called IATS. So if you don't want to donate via PayPal, which is where this left hand link takes you, then by all means contribute for now via Patreon. Or, of course, as you'll see up here, you can simply send us a check. By the way, if you pay tax in Canada, we can issue a charitable receipt. And we believe it may be possible to issue charitable receipts also that are valid in the USA. And we're looking into that. That's basically what we're asking you to do. It's very simple and it's not much given the problems there are in the world, how bad they're getting and how much worse they're getting and how little you actually have to do to make that possible for us. So that's me, I'm done. And if you'd like, oh yes, if you'd like to volunteer to help, we have a little web team that puts things out every 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 day on our, our news and analysis site, New Cold War. We It's very easy. A couple of hours in one day of the week is gonna add to the work of that team and would be greatly welcome. We would also give you a, a few skills which you may find later useful in life or even who knows in business. So that's it. Thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing from you. Bye. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, uh, so please, uh, those who heard the information and got the message, please contribute as generously as you can. Uh, it's important to maintain forums like this, you know, working and disseminating the information about the things that matter in the world for us to try to contribute to building a better world. Uh, so thanks very much for that, Alan. I was wondering whether either Alan or Radhika, before I go for the final part of the seminar webinar, whether there is any information regarding coming seminars or webinars that be, could be planned, would it be an interesting information to have? Because, you know, the the uh, the IMG, the International Manifesto Group, has a lot of inter interesting stuff that it does regularly. So Radhika, well, perhaps. Sure, I'll, I'll just say that we are, putting together several uh, webinars. Uh, please watch out for an announcement of a webinar on Russia, which is very special because we have Russians themselves who are in Russia, whose ability to talk to the rest of the world has been interrupted. Uh, they will be discussing amongst themselves, and they're not all of the same opinion, but they'll be discussing amongst themselves the new situation in which their country finds them itself both domestically and internationally, both economically and politically. So, uh, and we, we expect to hold it uh, two Sundays from now. Look at, that. This, look at that, this is what is coming. So thank you very much for that. That should whet your appetite, not only to contribute now generously, but also participate and get more people in. So can I go back finally to the questions? I mean, I have a couple of questions to Ileana and to uh, um, and also to Anahi. And the question was, why, number one, why this fragmentation between the indigenous population and the trade unions and the urban side of it? And is this being getting, is it getting worse or better? And what could, if anything, be done about it? Perhaps Ileana? Yeah, so there, that's a, a very good question. Maybe I can, I can, I'll answer this one in, in English, so I go ahead. I don't, yeah. So I don't don't as I don't speak as fast in English as in Spanish. So yeah. So first of all, I think um, so we come from a very very deep economic crisis caused by the COVID nineteen. Um, if we if we talk about um, uh, econ the economic um, sectors of our country, we have only 30% uh, for formal businesses and 70% of the population work in an, in an informal manner. Uh, whether they sell stuff on the streets or they try to have like a small business, but completely outside 
the formal area. I wouldn't, I, I don't want to say like outside the law because being poor is not illegal and trying to survive in a country like this that actually doesn't give you the opportunity to have a formal business because like the prices are just so overwhelming. It's just unfair to call this kind of surviving, uh, strategy, surviving strategies like being like outside the law. But the reality is that we live in a, in a deeply uh, informal uh, economy and of course, the pandemia has hardened uh, uh, the poor population, like in a most in a more aggressive way. So that I would say that's the very first uh, problem that we come. Uh, we are in a in a very in a very difficult economic moment of the country, and of course that impacts deeply the social movements and the possibilities to articulate but also I would like to 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 mention or to build over what Ben just said so in general like the left leftist sector and the social movements both in the rural areas and the urban areas have suffered from such a brutal violence both from the state and from the government during Fujimorism, during the regime, the dictatorship of Fujimori that have been killed basically. And afterwards, um, or like even before that, we have suffered for like stigmatization, what we call here terruqueo, because of the recent history of Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso, the terrorist movements that we have had here in the country from the eighties or at the beginning of the eighties. And so it's like a very stigmatized position to identify themselves as people from the left sector of the political spectrum. So it is hard to articulate in general, uh, leftist leaders have been killed and or suffered uh, from like illegal perse persecutions in general. But additionally, now we have on top of that uh, an economic crisis that is pretty obvious already we are suffering already for in, like inflation rates that are pretty new for our recent economic uh, history and but also of course we do have the like ngo left sectors more neoliberal left sectors that are more powerful that have more presence here in the capital in lima that are well related, that have better networking uh, than, of course, the uh, left, the popular left that is basically located in the rural areas, composed by people that mostly don't speak Spanish and uh, are basically completely out of the frame. That like for our current authorities, for example, don't are not even considered valid citizens with a voice or with, with something to say in general. And as Anais said, this is not something new. This has been going on for 201 years already. So uh, I, I would say that that's the situation. And, and we have, of course, different movements around the country. And it is also even hard to find um, I would say common references, uh, this like except for like the majority call now for like uh, general elections and to just yeah. get get Dina Boluarte out of the government. That I would say that's the common point that sure. everyone shares right now. Thank you very much, um, Eliana. I've, I know that Radica is an indicator as also Kyle, but I want to ask the same question in Spanish to Ana D just to make sure that Anaí had the chance. Anaí, Anaí le, le pregunté, pregunté sobre lo siguiente. Esta fragmentación del sector urbano, sindicatos principalmente, y el movimiento indígena, ¿qué está ocurriendo? ¿Qué se puede hacer? ¿Está mejorando, empeorando? Anaí, adelante. Anaí. Eh, sí, 
Escuchaste la pregunta. A ver, eh, yo creo que, como ha dicho también Eliana, seguimos siendo una sociedad muy fragmentada, ¿no? Eh, no hay, eh, creo que entre la década del 80 y el 90, el conflicto armado, el neoliberalismo, tendieron a disolver estas, estos lazos sociales, ¿no? Entonces las organizaciones se han ido constituyendo más bien a nivel local, territorial, con una dificultad enorme de articulación. ¿no? Y creo que ese es un proceso que todavía no se ha revertido. ¿no? Entonces es, 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 la realidad es, es esa. ¿no? Hay una serie de organizaciones partiendo por la comunidad indígena, que es un actor real que existe en los Andes, que te libera, que elige autoridades, que toma decisiones como ir a Lima a protestar, ¿no? pero que responde al presidente de esa comunidad. ¿no? Entonces, ¿cuál es la instancia que va a agregar a los presidentes de todas las comunidades? La instancia legítima, ¿no? Eh, no, no existe, ¿no? Oye, están los gremios, la Federación Campesina, la, eh, la Confederación Agraria, pero no tienen representatividad. Entonces, sí hay un nivel de fragmentación muy grande. Eh, una desconfianza muy grande también, esto es interesante, efectivamente hay un, creo que es el latinobarómetro el que publica los índices de, de confianza por país, y Perú es un, creo que el segundo país con menor confianza, incluso interpersonal, no confiamos en nadie más que en nuestra familia, o sea, eso creo que es algo que lamentablemente el neoliberalismo ha afirmado además con una posición muy individualista ¿no? del emprendedor que tiene que salir adelante entonces creo que la crisis y la movilización popular ha puesto en agenda la necesidad de articularse ¿no? o sea no se puede enfrentar este régimen de manera tan desarticulada aunque tengas masividad, aunque seamos miles en la calle, aunque seamos eh, muy convencido, si no hay un nivel de articulación y organización, va a ser muy difícil, ¿no? Yo creo que esto todavía está muy incipiente, muy en proceso, lamentablemente no podría decir ya se va a solucionar, esta es la, la vía, ¿no? Yo creo que eso está ya en la cancha de los dirigentes populares, de los dirigentes de las comunidades, ¿no? Y cómo se encuentran también con la... Eh, las organizaciones que ya existen, ¿no? como los, las centrales sindicales. Perú es un país con una informalidad tremenda, 70% de población informal y apenas un 3% de población sindicalizada. Entonces es obvio que los sindicatos no tengan fuerza. ¿no? Entonces sí creo que eh, es por el lado de la organización comunitaria, indígena, rural, eh, que podemos esperar un mayor nivel de coordinación, ¿no? Yo creo que ese proceso está abierto, la misma coyuntura ha impuesto la tarea de hacerlo, eh, pero sí creo que va a tener sus dificultades y eh, no va a ser tan inmediato, ¿no? Muy bien, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you're getting my the translation of what I'm saying. Thank you very much for that. Obviously, it's work in progress, and this is an opportunity to sort it out, but we'll see how it goes. Is, uh, is it, would it be okay if I take the three questions together from Radhika, Kyle, and Yuri? And I've seen there is a question for Ben, but I want to take that at the end because it's sort of more, you know, broader geopolitical. So, Radhika. Um, yeah, thanks. I have uh, two questions. Uh, first is uh, it would be really interesting to know from the speakers, ex you know, given that Peru was among the worst hit countries in terms of the deaths suffered during the pandemic and so on, how exactly did this play into the election campaign and the re election results? And secondly, I, I really appreciated very much Ben's, uh, I think, quite uh, effective uh, uh, identification of a new type of coup. And that sort of raises a question, a, a kind of congressional coup, essentially, a legislative coup against the executive, etc. This raises the question during the election, you know, how did how was it possible that such a left wing president was elected? But at the same time, they were in, they elect the Congress was elected, which was capable of moving against a uh, leftist president in such a way. If there can be any reflection on exactly what happened in the elections, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Radhika. Um, they will come back to all the questions together. Um, Kyle, uh, go ahead with your question. 
I wanted to start off with an acknowledgement. I worked for the Rex Tillerson State Department for about four weeks before I got fired at the U.S. Embassy in Libya. So I am part of the devil. Um, and then I wanted to make an observation. Zelensky's television show, The Servant of the People, is almost exactly the same as Castillo's uh, life story. It is a teacher who gets elected president. So we would support Zelensky on one hand, but apparently when it happens in real life, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I was really curious as to how communication, uh, you know, goes around in Peru. Is it Facebook? What role does Silicon Valley play in allowing Peruvians to communicate, to organize? Is, is that part of the problem or is it possibly part of the solution? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kyle. Um, how about Yuri? If, if Kyle, take your hand off. Thank you. Yuri, you're Thank on. you. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. Shall I go? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I just, uh, yes, very quickly, uh, Yuri Smouter, one plus one. I just wanted to ask, what are the conditions of uh, Pedro Castile, who is still being held in, in captivity, if I'm not mistaken, and what's been the coverage of the uh, Spanish-speaking corporate corporate media in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, tell us... No, no, like Telemundo and, and, and Univision, and has the Latin American left largely ignored whatever propaganda they've been uh, pushing. And uh, if uh, if we do have time, uh, I would I would love Ben Norton's response on what on because we've been talking about the plight of indigenous people. What's it going to take for the broad people power movement in the U.S. to you know show more solidarity and address the grievances of of Native Americans and, and Indigenous Hawaiians and Alaskans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri. Um, I'm going to speak in Spanish now. Well, I suppose you're getting my translation. So can I suggest that all the three speakers, could they divide the questions among themselves to make sure that they you know, overlap and so on and it's more efficient? So who wants to come in first? Eh, si quieren, yo podría empezar porque tengo que retirarme en unos minutos. Go ahead, adelante. Sí, eh, quería responder este tema de los medios, ¿no? Y de las redes sociales también. Creo que esto es fundamental. En el caso peruano hay un monopolio de la comunicación, quizá ahí después Eliana también lo puede retomar, eh, que es, la, es el que ha ido digamos, trabajando con el poder de manera muy articulada, ¿no? Y, y ya en la campaña, en la primera vuelta, tuvieron un rol muy decisivo para apoyar a la candidata Keiko Fujimori, ¿no? Ellos son los que, lo, los grandes medios de comunicación tienen una conducta, una forma de proceder que responde a sus dueños, ¿no? Deliberadamente a favor de un candidato y orientada a demoler al otro candidato, ¿no? En el caso de las elecciones, creo que incluso la OEA tuvo que hacer un llamado de atención, o sea, eh, en fin, fue muy eh, exacerbado el discurso de odio, ¿no?, frente a Castillo y sus partidarios, y como decía, además, con una dosis enorme de racismo, ¿no?, es, eh, y, y clasismo, ¿no?, de estas élites y sobre todo eh, la derecha limeña, urbana, ¿no?, dando cuenta de la amenaza que significaba que estos indios gobiernen, ¿no? Entonces, eso se extendió durante todo el gobierno, además Castillo tomó la decisión de no eh, tener eh, publicidad estatal, que es algo que tienen muchos países, ¿no? El Estado contrata publicidad a los grandes medios, se cortó eso y fue una declaratoria de, de guerra, ¿no? La prensa y los medios de comunicación arreciaron con mucho más fuerza además siendo parte activa de esta coalición que se armó para destituir, ¿no? Entonces estaban amplificando cualquier denuncia, sumándose a campañas de desprestigio, y lo que vemos ahora con, eh, con Dina Boluarte, ¿no? que prácticamente ni la investigan, no la tocan, son sumamente cuidadosos al hablar de ella, porque han retomado una buena relación. Obviamente la ciudadanía desconfía y se orienta mucho a la, los medios alternativos, como decimos aquí. ¿no? Es un momento en el cual han tomado más fuerza eh, comunicadores populares, gente que a partir de sus canales de YouTube, de Facebook, de Twitter, empiezan a difundir lo que está pasando, ¿no? Eso creo que es una característica de esta etapa. Eh, y bueno, se usan las redes que hay, ¿no? O sea, es básicamente 
el caso de Facebook, de YouTube, ¿no? Eh, que son las redes que más se usan en el caso peruano. Eh, y como digo, eh, estos medios alternativos, también radios en algunas regiones, ¿no? Que han permitido romper este cerco mediático que imponen los grandes medios, ¿no? Y yo creo que los, las corporaciones internacionales han seguido esa pauta, ¿no? CNN, por ejemplo, eh, ha seguido esa pauta de culpabilizar a Castillo, de modo que él es el golpista por haber leído esa, el discurso del 7 de diciembre, y eh, lo, lo que está haciendo más bien Dina Boluarte y la derecha es restaurar la democracia, ¿no? Eh, ese creo que es el el guión que han seguido estas corporaciones, ¿no? Y dándole cierta importancia, incluso este periodista Fernando del Rincón, ¿no? Le ha dedicado varios programas a, a Perú, imponiendo esta matriz narrativa, digamos, ¿no? Eh, Castillo fue un golpista, corrupto, eh, casi equivalente a Fujimori, y eh, lo que se está haciendo ahora más bien es rescatar la democracia, ¿no? Y que es el guión también de los grandes medios nacionales. ¿no? Eh, eso creo, pero sí me parece digno de resaltar, porque creo que va, es una tendencia que va a continuar, que es los medios alternativos. ¿no? Creo que eso, eso va a venir con, con más fuerza, va a seguir, y es muy esperanzador que la misma población en las protestas grave, cubre, difunde, ¿no? está haciendo todo el trabajo que no hacen los medios de comunicación formales, digamos. Thank you very much, um, and I, I, I know you have to go. Um, te lo voy a decir en español. Muchísimas gracias por tu tiempo y tu participación. Ha sido muy iluminadora. Somos mucho más eh, conocedores de la situación de Perú. And we have a huge amount of work to do to help the struggle for democracy in Perú. Muchas gracias, Anaí. Can I have Eliana then, please, to answer some of the questions asked? Yes, sure. Yeah, just um, uh, adding to what just 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 and I said, we have a highly concentrated corporate media. Um, the calculation is that around eighty uh, percent of the big media here in the country belongs to one one business group that actually also belongs to one family, the Miro Quesada family. They are the owners of, of course, TV like. Um, outlets, uh, newspapers, radios, and so they do have also their own social media and they pay a lot of uh, advertising also in the social media. And they do receive millions and, and millions of soles for, uh, for state advertising. So that, that's what uh, and I mentioned that Pedro Castillo decided not to give to the corporate media, the advertising money from the state. And of course that wasn't taken very well uh, from the, the corporate media. So, and it is not only that those like, uh, those companies belong to one family, the production of journalist materials, the pro journalist products and the coverage in general is highly centralized in Lima. So almost every journalist product that we saw see on TV is produced in Lima. Um, and that's also why during the uh, general uh, campaign in 2021, the one that was won by Pedro Castillo, it was a surprise for like people in Lima in general. And of course, it was a surprise for all the serious and most important prominent journalists here in Peru that Pedro Castillo was the one that, that went to the second round or the ballotage with Keiko Fujimori because they barely knew his name. They barely knew who he was. They remembered him, you know, because he led, um, led um, uh, mobilization of teachers, of public teachers, um, because he was the leader of the union in 2017. And I remember at the time that Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, that was still the president at the moment, um, didn't even authorize the Minister of Education to receive him for a meeting because they didn't recognize him as a legitimate leader of his own union. So they didn't let him sit down on the table with the Minister of Education at the moment. So because there was a um, report from the Ministry uh, of 
Ministerio del Interior, so the head of look like national security that said that he had li has had links with shining path and terrorists and so they didn't even allow him to sit down and have a conversation with the authorities of the country so that was pedro castillo so that's why like after a very very polarized campaign for the first round of the elections in 2021 it was almost like people in lima wouldn't believe that he was the one that was going to run against Keiko Fujimori. Of course, because the media here in Lima didn't show us that candidate that was actually putting together huge rallies uh, because all the, the, the other candidates decided to run the campaign basically on the social media with the excuse of the pandemic and stuff like that. And they thought it was going to be enough. They thought it was going to be enough to invest tons of money uh, in the broad, in the in the big media here in Lima, and it wasn't enough. So Pedro Castillo mobilized people in the rural areas, and and very strongly in the southern area of our country. Uh, it, it, it's a different topic that the pandemia was the best excuse for the state to banish from many places in the country, especially in rural places. So we already have a weak state, and the state disappeared from many places in Peru. So. I think that, of course, the, con the context of the pandemic was very important because Pedro Castillo was able to move like quietly for the eyes of Lima. But of course, it was a huge movement in the other areas. And of course, as always, Lima is never looking for what is going on in the rural areas. Lima is never paying attention on what is going on outside our own limits of this terrible city um so yeah now the alternative media or the social media are very important actors and of course uh the congress and the rightist uh, political parties are always basically speaking like uh, very outspoken against the independent media and against um what we call alternative media here uh, yeah because they consider them enemies of the state and en enemies of the system and that they are seen as a like as a dangerous actor uh, for the status quo here in Lima. So I would say that social media are mostly part of the solution, but of course, um, well, this is something that we are still working on. So I, that, that's what I wanted to say about it. Thank you very much, Eliana. I think we'll, we'll continue to examine this part of the surprise because it was a surprise for everyone. I think Peruvians and ourselves will continue to find out new details, but thank you very much for that insight. Can I then come back to Ben? I think it's a very good question. Uh, I have a question for Ben, he says, I'm reading literally from Katerina Lai. There are changes in the continent financial systems, new currency, new alliances, deal with a new position, etc. Can the shift away from the dollar help by isolating legal governments such as the Peruvian one? Ben. Great. Yeah, I'll respond to that, which is an excellent question. And I'll very briefly respond to the other questions that, that were asked that weren't addressed. So Radhika had a good question about the Congress in Peru. I mean, we should also understand other, other speakers have mentioned that studies have shown that the Congress is the most corrupt institution in Peruvian politics. And that explains why it has 6% approval. And I should mention that even the week that Castillo was overthrown in December December 7th of 2022. Another study had shown that at that moment, the Congress had 7% approval. So it's not something new. It's not just because of the coup. It is well known among all Peruvians that the Congress is a bastion of corruption. And the way you get into Congress is you buy your way in. And this is not even just speculation. There have been numerous scandals that have rocked Peruvian politics. A well-known example is the so-called Mamani Videos scandal which is named after figures who were involved in this corruption scandal, including the son of Alberto Fujimori, the former U.S.-backed fascist dictator who is in prison, and his children are part of a political dynasty. And his son is actually also in prison because he was filmed on camera bribing other, other Congress members, he was a member of Congress, to vote against the destitution process against Kaczynski, the former right wing president. So essentially, the way that Congress works in Peru is you buy your way in and it's the elites in Lima, the Peruvian oligarchy and, and bourgeoisie 
And then they just basically, I mean, it's similar to the US Congress, which has a similar approval rating. They just vote with whatever their sponsors want them to go along with. And and it was clear from when Castillo won the election, which was a surprise to so many people, it was clear from the beginning that he was going to face significant opposition because the Peru Libre Party, and then he had other left-wing parties, although that alliance split, and then he actually fought with his own party. It was a mess. But anyway, the point is that from day one, it was clear that the left had a small minority within the Congress. The right wing always had a super majority in the Congress and tried to prevent him from doing everything from day one. Now, in terms of uh, the observation about Zelensky in Ukraine, it's a very funny and an apt comparison. I mean, Zelensky, uh, who is an actor, he he became famous because of his TV show, Servant of the People, which was funded by Klomoisky, this billionaire oligarch in Ukraine. And then he, this is this oligarch who funded the media corporation that made his TV show. And then after Zelensky ran for office, creating a political party named after his TV show, Servant of the People, and his political party was funded by the same oligarch, Klomoisky, that funded the TV show. So the difference is Castillo was actually the character that Zelensky, the actor, played on TV. Castillo was a poor teacher from a rural area representing the majority indigenous population. And of course, that was what was such a big threat to the oligarchy in Peru, which has governed the country for decades. And I should point out that, I mean, there's there's a class element strongly. I mean, that's what that's what makes the oligarchy the oligarchy. It's the capitalist class. But there's also a racial element. Several of the last uh, presidents in Peru going back to the 90s have been of European descent in the case of Kaczynski, which is clearly a Polish surname. And there are others with German surnames. And then, of course, Fujimori, who's of Japanese descent and his family is very wealthy. So the indigenous descent majority in Peru have been excluded largely from the political process. Um, now, as for his conditions in prison, uh, there have been very few interviews with with uh, Castillo. Um, there was one interview that was done by a small left wing Spanish alternative media outlet called El Salto. And they were able to communicate with him through his lawyer, who's the only person who's been able to communicate with with um, Castillo. And I'm going to read a quote from this interview. It was in Spanish, but they were asked about his con conditions. And he said, and if he was able to communicate with his family. And this was a report published in February. And he said, no, this is Castillo speaking through his lawyer. No, I have not been able to communicate with my family. I don't know how they're doing, and I hope they're okay. I have no access to communication. I have not been able to do a video call with them. They're they're in refuge in Mexico. I would love to speak with them. So this I mentioned that Mexico has provided support. The left wing president uh, Amlo Lopez Obrador has provided support to Castillo's family. And uh, by the way, his government did the same after the coup against Evo Morales, backed by the U.S. in 2019 in Bolivia. Now, um, uh, they, the questions about the media were covered very well. I would just add that, I mean, the English language media has been just as atrocious as the Spanish language media. And across both Spanish and English language corporate media, they accuse Castillo of trying to launch a coup, which is just truly dystopian. I mean, they're accusing the coup victim of trying to launch a coup, which is preposterous. Um, now, finally, uh, there was another question about U.S. solidarity. And I mean, again, I think we should just recognize uh, that the United States bears a huge responsibility. I mean, clearly the Peruvian oligarchy had its they were trying to overthrow Castillo from day one, and they don't necessarily need help from the U.S. to do that. But the United States and Canada have legitimized this coup. As I spelled out earlier, the vast majority of the region is against this coup. If the coup regime did not have the political support of the U.S. and Canada, it would not be able to continue delaying elections. This is an unelected regime that has not held elections and keeps delaying election and has killed over 60 protesters. So there's a lot that people in the United States can do. And yeah, I mean, people in the United States need to recognize and Canada that First Nations, Indigenous nations are suffering from a lot of the same conditions of colonialism and ra racism that indigenous descent Peruvians are facing. And finally, the very good question about the financial system. I mean, this is something that that is not getting enough coverage. I mean, I've been trying to cover this as much as I can. 
There has been a little coverage of the move toward de-dollarization in Asia, which is, of course is very important, considering it represents a plurality of the global population and a, and a plurality of the global GDP. But I mean, Latin America also plays an important role in this move toward de-dollarization and the construction of a multipolar world. Lula, the president of the most populous country in Latin America, Brazil, which is the eighth most populous country on earth, which is the se the seventh largest economy according to per excuse me the seventh most populous country with the eighth largest economy according to purchasing power parity measurement of the economy uh Lula just visited China and he signed 15 agreements and they represent all areas of collaboration with China Brazil is one of the co-founders of the BRICS system of course it's the B in the BRICS BRICS even before it was BRICS with an S, it was BRIC with before South Africa joined, and Lula was one of the co-founders. And in fact, uh, Brazil, uh, Lula is the only co the only co-founder individual, co-founding individual of the BRICS who's still leader, because it was the Congress Party in India who co-founded it. It was not Narendra Modi, and it, it and Putin wasn't president actually. It was actually Medvedev. But anyway, so um, Latin America plays a huge role in this. While he was in China. Lula gave an incredible speech at the New Development Bank, which is the BRICS Bank, in which he called for challenging the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. And he said that we need to do more trade in our local currencies and give out loans in local currencies. And also this week, Dilma Rousseff, who is the new president of the BRICS Bank, the New Development Bank, she was the former president of Brazil as well from Lula's leftist workers party. She announced actually in an interview with Chinese media that the BRICS bank has plans to give 30% of its loans in local currency, which is a very significant development. So now we're seeing financing, not just trade, but financing in local currencies, which is gonna be very important for countries in Latin America and Africa that have suffered from a, a lack of access to, to US dollars, which has been, for instance, in the case of Argentina, a huge reason for the hyperinflation we see in Argentina, which is constantly hemorrhaging its foreign exchange reserves because it has to, to use those dollars to serve its dollar denominated debt. And similarly in Africa, for instance, uh, Kenya is also hemorrhaging its dollars, which is why Kenya just worked out a deal to buy energy from the UAE and Saudi Arabia in its local currency on credit because they're trying to save their dollars to service their dollar denominated debt. So th these are all massive developments. And the last thing I'll say here about Peru, now Peru doesn't necessarily play a direct role in this because when even Castillo came in, he was so, his hands were so tied by the, the undemocratic regime in Peru. I mean, his main democratic mandate was to try to have a, con a constituent assembly to write a new constitution because it is impossible to have an actually democratic popular government in Peru with the Fujimorista constitution. It is not a democracy. It is an oligarchy, a neoliberal oligarchy in which the elected president is literally incapable of passing progressive reforms. Castillo's main promises were one, he wanted the constituent assembly he also wanted more representation for poor and, and indigenous descent Peruvians. And he wanted, he didn't even want to, he, he had talked when he campaigned about nationalizing the natural resources in Peru, which is are very important. I'll speak about in a second. But even when he became president, he actually watered that down because he recognized that he wasn't able to do that. All he was asking for is taxing the mining corporations so the government would have around 40% of the mining proceeds so he could use that money to pay for education and healthcare and social services. But even that was too much for the Peruvian capitalist class. And this is, I mean, I shouldn't say this at the end. I should have said this at the beginning of my, of my segment, but very briefly here, I just want to highlight the fact that, I mean, Peru is a commodities powerhouse. This is a very important country for the global economy. Peru is the second largest producer of copper in the entire world. Just the country of Peru is responsible for 10% of global copper production. The only other country on earth that produces more copper is Chile, which is responsible for 27% of global copper production. So between Chile and Peru together, they, they are responsible for more than one third of global copper production. If you look at the Peruvian economy, I mean, it, it is a country that relies on their export of minerals. 58.7% of Peru's exports come from the mining sector. 
And if you look, 30% of its exports are from copper, 15% are from gold, 14% from zinc, around 3% from iron. And there are also other um, natural resources, especially gas. In fact, what's not that well known is that Peru is one of the leading producers of, of gas in the Americas. It's the United States, Trinidad and Tobago, and then Peru. And Europe is importing Peruvian liquefied natural gas to make up for the Russian pipeline gas that it's no longer buying because of the Western sanctions on Russia. And it, that's, that's why it's not a coincidence that the, I mean, this is an article I wrote about this, but the US, the CIA agent turned US ambassador in Peru, Lisa Kenna, has been holding public meetings, at least publicly disclosed meetings, with the ministers of mining and energy in Peru to discuss the investments of foreign mining corporations in Peru. And if you look at those mining corporations, they're from Canada, actually represents the largest outside of Peru itself. Canada, the United States, Britain, Switzerland, Japan, and also Brazil, which has mining interests. So, I mean, uh, if we want to understand, I mean, Peru plays a, a very significant role in the global economy. The, and, and one other fi final note here is that uh, Goldman Sachs, they, in 2022, they released a, released a white paper called Green Metals, Copper is the New Oil. So we talked about the role of oil in the coup against Mossadegh in 1953 because he nationalized the Anglo-Persian oil company and said that, that, is, that the oil belongs to the Iranian people. Well, copper is the new oil. That's the word of Goldman Sachs. And especially as we transition toward renewable energy technology, Peru, like Bolivia, you know, which was referred to as the first lithium coup, Bolivia being the world's largest producer of lithium, these countries in South America are extremely geopolitically strategic and economically important for the global economy. And that's why it's no surprise to see the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador talking about the importance of investment in the mining sector in Peru. Thank you very much, Ben. I've seen Abkan has a question on Radhika or Radhika. Abkan, please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. It's I know it's very late in your discussion, so my question may have to be treated largely as rhetorical. First, the observation. Um, I trust people will agree that this is the uh, main characteristic of Peru, and that is an extreme form of centralized political dominance and control, and an external, especially extreme form of centralization and control of the economic system. In that situation, isn't it perhaps necessary to be thinking of a corresponding forms of popular organization. Now I assume, but that's more of a question than a, than, than our than a statement, is that there is heavy indigenous, historically indigenous forms of organization uh, and that there are, uh, there certainly is the example, we can think of the, the, the uh, revolution, the, the, the communal communist revolution in Russia where there were pre-existing worker and soldier and farmer created councils. Aren't there, there's also the model of, of um, Venezuela, but of course it was the state itself which established the communal systems by law and they had a, had a constituent assembly first. But given the difficulties that the Peruvian people now face, um, maybe it is a rhetorical question, but one for, I hope for consideration and that is, the forms of popular organization that could be established uh, based on what's there presently uh, to begin the development of alternative parallel forms of potential governance that could challenge the system. Thank you very much. I think the answer to that is a very big fat yes. <laughs> Radhika, can we have your question, please? <clears throat> I just have a very small clarification to add to Ben's excellent answer to Katerina Lai's question on, on uh, alternative currencies and whether this would play an important role in, in, uh, in making a dent in elite power in Peru. And I would say that in addition to things Ben said, a critical element, which I think is not getting enough attention, is that these this shift will only be effective in putting power in the hands of ordinary people and their representatives if 
capital controls are implemented. And at the moment, because it's capital controls that allow elites of every country to move money out of that country without restriction. And this money is then used in alliance with the United States to undermine elected governments and so on. And also, of course, to create economic crises via investment strikes and so on. And we need all the every progressive in the world, in Latin America, in Asia, everywhere, needs to start thinking about capital controls or what is sometimes in a more sanitized form called capital account management. That is to say the government needs to have control over the public authorities, democratically elected public authorities need to have control over how the wealth generated in that country is used and where it is taken. That's all. Thanks. Very much for that clarification. I think that will sort of not bring the Peru crisis to the end, but certainly our discussion. Can I thank everybody who organized this? And can I thank the speakers particularly because they you know, were wonderful, very clar clarifying, and with huge amounts of insight. Can I also thank the speakers because the speakers you know, had a huge amount of work and so thank you very much. You um, maybe Radhika wants to say something else as well. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to, I think you meant, uh, when you said speakers, you meant the interpreters. I want to thank uh, Julio Moraes and Arnold August, both of whom have had an enormous uh, uh, task today of translating continuously from English to Spanish and Spanish to English, and they have done it on a volunteer basis. So thank you very much. And thanks also to Paul Graham, who works as our videographer, and it's thanks to him that our videos are available. So in such a timely fashion uh, to view on the web, uh, including the various clips and so on. So thanks to all these three. And of course, thanks to you, Francisco, for helping us organize this so well. My pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone. I totally thank you. endorse the you know, Radhika's work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And have a good time and then come back to help us with Peru. Thank you for paying attention on what's going on on Peru and please keep spreading the voice on, on what we are suffering here in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Elena.